हेलो हेलो <laughs> All right. Well, welcome back from that uh, lovely social hour. We're so um, happy that everybody was able to have plenty of time for mingling and socializing. And uh, a big shout out to our volunteers who are who are helping with you know yeah yeah absolutely. Um, so we, before we get started with Martin, we wanted to just bring up our amazing crew of staff and interns and fellows. So come on up, everybody. <laughs> Where is he going? 
going? <laughs> yeah, we're big. Yep. Keep going, keep going. Yeah, so uh, uh, teamwork definitely makes the dream work. This is our amazing team, minus one. We can't seem to get everybody in one place these days. Um, for those of you who might be missing Dr. Ali Candelmo, she's our um, manager of the conservation science program and has been with Reef about five years. She is gonna have a baby in a couple of weeks. Yay! <laughs> We're all so excited for the baby to come. Um, so she obviously couldn't be here with us, but every, all of the rest of our staff and our amazing interns and fellows are all here. So maybe we'll just pass the mic really quick. And I, we weren't gonna might do that, but I think we should. So <laughs> we know who you are. I'm Christy. And I would just say it's amazing when we started ReFest 10 years ago, nine years ago, we all fit in such a small corner of the stage. Some of you remember that. And now we take up the whole stage. So I'm so glad to have all of you here. Okay. Hi, I'm Hillary. I'm based remotely in Colorado. And I am the Education and Conservations Program Manager. Woo! <laughs> Hi, I'm Moose. I'm the Education Outreach Program Manager based here in Key Largo. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Asabri. I'm one of the new marine conservation interns and I'm based here in Key Largo as well. Nice. I'm Lex and I'm the Conservation Science Associate and I'm also in Key Largo. I'm Noah. I'm also one of the new marine conservation interns. And like all the other MCIs, I'm based here in Key Largo. My name is also Noah. Um, I'm also an intern, and I'm also here in Key Largo. <laughs> My name is Dylan, and I am the Marine Conservation Fellow. And just like the other uh, interns, I am also here in Key Largo. I'm Carolyn. I am the Education Outreach Fellow, and I'm also based here in Key Largo. I'm Jana Nichols, uh, <laughs> Citizen Science Program Manager, and I am not in Key Largo. <laughs> I am in Vancouver, Washington, the other Vancouver, not BC, Vancouver, Washington, right by Portland, Oregon, and I work remotely for Reef and always have from there. So. Hi, I'm Lily. I'm an intern. Yeah. And I'm in Key Largo. And I'm in Key Largo, too. <laughs> I am Amy. I am the Communications and Engagement Manager, and I am also not based in Key Largo, although I used to be. I now live in St. Augustine, Florida. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Stacy Anderson. I am Reef's Program Services Coordinator, and for a long time I used to be based in the Keys, but now I'm working remotely out of North Carolina. Hi, I'm Sierra, I'm the Citizen Science Coordinator, and I am based in Key Largo. Hi, I'm David, I'm the Campus Coordinator, and I am based in Key Largo. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jen Locke. I'm the postdoctoral researcher, and I'm based in Orlando, but you might see me periodically in Key Largo as part of the SMILE project. So. I guess, well, and uh, I'm Christy, and I'm one of the executive directors, and I'm based in San Diego. And I'm Martha Klitschke. It's good to see all of you. I know most of you. I was based in the Keys for a long time, but I moved to the very cold Chicago and get to come down to the Keys pretty frequently. All right. Yeah. So amazing team. Thank you all so much. I mean, they, they have worked an amazing number of hours being ready for this event, working this event, and um, it has not gone unnoticed. They are long days, early mornings, late nights, 
and a lot of heavy lifting. So thank you very much. We did want to, so this year, Sierra Barkdahl is the mastermind of this event. She even, you would never know it, but she is the one. She has made all of this happen. Every box, everything, every list has been uh, led and executed by Sierra. We could not have done, I mean, everything's been as smooth as silk because of Sierra and we're so grateful. We have a little something that Moose is gonna maybe grab from behind, just a little something for your desk or your home or wherever you wanna put that. <laughs> and then uh, we had mentioned our volunteers before we, you know, Martha talked about um, uh, the importance of volunteers here locally and our docents and we have a great team of volunteers here and all kind of led by Nancy and I hope she's still here. Nancy, are you here? Oh yes, Nancy, come down, come down. What? The price is right. So Nancy, we have a little something for you too because uh, if you notice, she was there last night directing. She has a great team of folks who help her put on all of our community events, Fish and Friends every month, that open house last night. She is the one who's, you know, figuring out the food, figuring out the set of pieces, getting everybody to kind of rally around and make sure that we can do what we can do. So thank you, Nancy. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you all. Sierra, you can go back to the booth. Um, <laughs> oh, yes. Our amazing volunteers. All right. Thank you all. All right. We're going to give Sierra a moment to get back to her post upstairs <laughs> so that we can make sure everything can run. But, um, in the meantime, uh, yeah, we're all good. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, without further ado, thank you for kind of allowing us that opportunity to recognize everyone and bring everybody up here. It's certainly it is our reef family and, um, it's a privilege that for these events where we all, cause you, as you saw, we're all little, we're about half of us are distributed. And so it's a great time for us all to come back together and work really hard and be together and, um, make things happen. So um, I am really honored to be able to welcome Martin Russell to our ReefFest seminar lineup this year. Um, he probably got the farthest award because he came all the way from Australia and we're so grateful. <laughs> um, we've known Martin a long time. He has a shared love of grouper like a lot of us and has worked on spawning aggregations but is also a very active member of the Gulf and Caribbean Fisheries Institute uh, conference that I mentioned earlier where I saw John talk last year. Um, myself and Bryce Simmons both serve on that board with Martin as chair and uh, does great work through this region connecting fishers, communities, and scientists. So it's, a, it's really a, a great um, organization to be a part of. So in his day job when he's not wrangling all of us on the GCFI board, he is a manager of the Coral Sea Marine Park, and we're gonna learn all about that amazing place in a couple of minutes, so I won't say much more about that, but he's been working in marine protected areas for over 25 years. Uh, he has extensive research on spawning aggregations. He helped found uh, CERCFA, which is the Society for the Conservation of Reef Fish Aggregations, very important entity. And as I said already, he's um, worked obviously very extensively in the Pacific, Asia Pacific, but also in the Caribbean as well. And so we're so grateful you're here and come on up, Martin. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks, Christy. And I'll just do a sound check, is that okay? All right. Um, <clears throat> it's an it's a honor and a privilege to be here. So thank you and thanks to Christy and Martha for uh, the invitation uh, to be part of the family of Reef. That was a good point you just made just then. It is a family. And I can see by the, 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 the group here and the, the passion and the interest, which is, is fantastic. Um, from small things, big things grow. And that's something that resonates in my mind. In, and it just takes a little thought or, a, or an idea, and then it grows and getting that, that momentum. Um, so it, I'm really happy to be here. And I will give you a, a 
bit of information today. I've got a lot to get through, and you'll walk away from here today understanding about where the Coral Sea Marine Park is, how big it is, how it's managed, um, a few interesting facts, and I might quiz you at the end. <laughs> um, lots of photographs, um, which I will work my th way through. Um, someone told me that I should just throw a bit of Australian language at you just to make you warm you up so you can understand, but put up your hand if you can't understand a word I say. <laughs> um, but anyway, g'day. I'm from Australia, I'm not from Key Largo, and my name is not Noah. Um, <laughs> um, my, name is, my name is Martin. And most people call me Marty. Um, and, you know, saying things like chuck another prawn on the barbie is something we kind of say sometimes. And she'll be right, and no worries. We'll get through this. I don't need my glasses, I don't think. So, a little bit about me. Um, so I live in Brisbane. I'm from Tasmania, a little island on the southern part of Australia, which I think most people probably know where the Tasmanian devil is from. Uh, living in Brisbane, I manage the Coral Sea Marine Park and I've been doing the management of the marine park since 2018. Um, before that, I, uh, I actually wrote five management plans for the marine parks around Australia, um, which uh, took me a few years and we got it through Parliament in 2018. And I started with Parks Australia in 2009, so I've been there a while. Before 2009, I used to be with the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, which manages the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park, and worked there as a senior manager and, and zoning and management of that park. And so my career has been in marine parks, um, probably not intentionally, but I started out as actually a dive instructor back in Tasmania years and years ago and um, then went to university and studied fishery science, applied science degree. And then I, my first job out of uni was um, a research diver, uh, researching crown of thorn starfish, looking for little starfish and um, looking for the bigger ones as well, uh, because it was a problem and still is a problem on the Great Barrier Reef. A little bit of diversity there, but it, my trajectory of path is marine park management. That's what I do, that's what I love doing. And so the key thing there, um, I have a passion for it, and so I encourage, you know, people have passion no matter where you are in your life or career. And so, um, yeah, keep up the good energy here. I'm noticing it. It's, it's fantastic. Okay, so I will give you a whirlwind tour about the Coral Sea Marine Park, and so you'll be all knowledgeable after this. Uh, it's managed by an organisation or an agency, which is an Australian government agency called Parks Australia. Um, the, it, Australia has one of the world's largest networks of marine parks, um, 4.3 million square kilometres all up. We have 63 offshore parks, and so that's what I'm talking about here is off, off the coast, it's not on the coast. 48% of Australia's oceans are protected in marine park, and 22% of the oceans are protected in what's called high protection status, no take zones. Um, yeah, these are the coloured zones of the parks around Australia, the green and the yellow and the blue, so the different zoning types. I'll be talking to you about this park here, which I'll put into more context in a minute. We have marine parks as, as remote as Norfolk Island, and this one here, Macquarie, is right down in the southern, out of south of, of Tasmania, that is um, recently been rezoned um, as a larger marine protected area. In context, uh, the Coral Sea Marine Park is here. Um, if people are familiar with Australia, there's the Great Barrier Reef. And I was talking to uh, some colleagues outside, and we're talking about Ningaloo Reef, which is over here, and Papua New Guinea up the top there. It's vast, it's remote, and it's wild. And um, the Coral Sea Marine Park is the largest of the Australia's marine parks. It's almost a million square kilometres. Convert that to miles, I can't do it in my head. Um, it extends more than 1,000 kilometres offshore in parts. So when I say that, this is the most furthest extent. Um, this reef here called Malish is, is far offshore. That's about six, 700 miles. If you were to leave Cairns on a boat, it would take you three days to get there. Um, so it's a big park, extends on the outside of the Great Barrier Reef, it starts up near Papua New Guinea and it finishes 
near Brisbane, basically. I try to put this in context. It's about six times the size of Florida State. Um, and then I'd try to draw, draw it on where we are. So if you were to have the Coral Sea Marine Park here, it would extend from Caracas um, up to Miami and then from Jamaica out to the British Virgin Islands. Um, so that's the extent of it. And it's, it's got a lot of ocean in it, a lot of um, habitats, which I'll talk about in a minute. And, and so therefore, the Coral Sea Marine Park is actually an oceanic kind of park. This um, shows you here the, the continental shelf. So if that's Queensland coastline, this would be the Great Barrier Reef, which is relatively shallow. It has shallow reefs, um, maybe 40, 50 metres, which is in feet, 150 feet. Um, that's the Great Barrier Reef. This, from here out, is the Coral Sea Marine Park. And what we're talking about is deep ocean abyssal plain um, and then the shallower waters up to these sea mounts. And these mountains just rise out of the ocean from 4,000 metres or 2,000 metres, really deep. And at the top are islands, which is not like these islands, that this is a, a general representation, but we have that's where the reefs occur. So how do you manage such a system? Um, and have, and the, the key is, well, let's try to understand it. So the management of the Coral Sea Marine Park, it's Australian government. Uh, we have a management plan in place, which I said I, I, I was part of the team or led the team to write the management plan. It's a 10-year plan. I have uh, a team of four staff, um, which, which sounds small. Um, but I'll tell you why it's OK. Um, we work in collaboration with a lot of other government and non-government agencies. We engage um, the help of um, researchers, volunteers, citizen science, universities um, to work together to, to look after this place. But my team, or the team that I'm part of, we, we get together and we work our, our, our daily business um, using the management plan. And we also have an advisory committee made up of different stakeholders or, or, or experts in, in whether it's tourism or shipping or science, indigenous. The activities in the Coral Sea Marine Park, um, even though it's far offshore, it's, it's remote, um, there is use. Um, and so there is commercial fishing and the type of fishing we have are a, a trawl, which is um, otter trawl or demersal trawl. Um, sea cucumber, aquarium fish and coral collecting, so that's dive-based fisheries collecting by hand, and also tuna longline fishing. Recreationals get out there and fish, um, mostly, well, reef fish, but mostly it's um, pelagic uh, for game fish is, is a, a key um, fishery there. Actually, um, black marlin spawn in the Coral Sea. Um, and I forgot to mention, I have a connection with spawning aggregations. I think you mentioned that, I, yeah, um, that I uh, interested in, or I've been working for a long time in spawning aggregations. The Coral Sea has the only known spawning aggregation for black marlin in the Pacific Ocean. And so, but we know little about it. Um, so we have research activities, we have yachting, transport, cruise ships, diving, um, defence training for Australia's Defence Force, as well as um, weather stations. So there's a weather station there, um, unmanned. Okay, there are two key projects that um, uh, my team, we work on, islands and reefs. And that previous um, diagram that I showed you about, that most of it's deep ocean. Well, we could spend our time focusing in on that one on the deep ocean or we focus in on the islands and reefs and we're choosing this as our key focus to understand those habitats because we can get to them. Um, they are susceptible to change, such as the impacts from climate change. Um, so we're studying the islands and reefs. We have 60 islands in the Coral Sea. There are islands, islets and caves. We, we call them caves, not keys, with a C and for reasons I don't know. Oh, that reminds me, grouper. Um, look, <laughs> Australians, for some reason, call grouper gropers. <laughs> and, and, and 
no matter how hard I try, because they spell it G-R-O-P-E-R, and I keep on saying, well, groupers don't grope. Uh, it's a bit embarrassing, so anyway, we'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep trying. Um, so where was I? Ks. We have 21 of those 60 have vegetation on them, um, which is important because uh, vegetation is habitat for birds, for example. They're all un uninhabited islands, which is a saving grace, except for one which, which has a weather station on it and there's four people that live there for six months at a time. They get on island and they stay there and they don't come off and no one visits for six months. It's wild and remote and there, there's an example of an island here. Um, quite beautiful. We have 1,830 reefs and that's counting. When we wrote the management plan four years ago, five years ago, all we could say we, was that we had 34 vast reefs because that was the information level that we had. Since then, we've studied and we've done the work and now we know there's at least 1,800 reefs, individual reefs that can be identified as discrete reefs. We have seamounts um, on, um, on, and it's extinct volcanoes are what makes these reefs where they are. It's interesting with the, the rise of sea level and these seamounts that I mentioned, the corals that have been growing around the seamounts have kept up with the rise of sea level. So that's where the reefs are and where they couldn't keep up, then they're submerged. We don't have big peaked islands. All the islands out there are all kind of the same height and they're just keeping up with the sea level. It's really interesting. Uh, we have canyons, which are huge, vast canyons and the abyssal plains. Okay. Um, research and monitoring, which is what I'll talk about now. And I'm, I'm gonna give you information about how we research and monitor the coral sea. Um, I'll give you some information about islands and, and, and the most recent work that we've been doing on islands, and then I'll talk to you about reefs, which is much more uh, interesting for you, I know. But I know there's some people who here who are really interested in birds. Hands up who's really interested in birds. Okay, so I'll tell you a bit about birds. The way we do the research and monitoring is, like I said, we have partnerships or collaborations with, with the experts. Um, whether it be agencies from different governments or universities, volunteers and citizen science. Um, In-water dive surveys are a key part of our work um, and using also ROVs and, and BRUVs. People know what I mean by BRUVs and ROVs, remote operating vehicles and baited remote underwater. What's the V stand for? Video. There you go. Um, acoustic and satellite tagging, both of fish and, and, and for example, turtles. We do island-based health checks. And that's a specific health check on how these islands are going. And we also use satellite, aerial and drone habitat mapping. And that's a new technology or new technologies that we're using that is so useful for us to understand these habitats. Okay, so islands. I'll start with the islands and then I'll talk to you about the reefs. We have 60 islands. As I said, there's 21 veg with vegetation or plant communities on them. These are uh, islands that have grown, like I said, they've grown with the reefs, but they've been there for a long time. So some of them are more established uh, and some of them are just sand caves. They, they don't have any vegetation, but they're both very important habitats for seabirds and turtles. There's globally significant bird populations. We, we currently know we have 34 species of birds. It doesn't sound like many, but the populations of those species are quite significant. We also have a, a green turtle nesting population that only nests in the Coral Sea. Um, we also have a bit of a problem that we're looking at with marine debris. The marine debris washes in from the east. So it comes in from the Pacific Island Northeast and Pacific Island areas onto these islands. It doesn't come from Australia out to the Coral Sea. It's because of the predominant weather patterns. Um, these images here, I just want to point out that, oh, another one. That's a vegetated island. This one here is a sand cave, like I said, and it moves. So 
this edge here, which is a high water mark, might actually move over here. So the sand moves, but see all the divots in here, they're all turtle um, nests. They're all, they're all what we call body pits. Some of these islands are just so full of these, it's like a moonscape uh, of, of turtle nests. And the, the turtles also nest in, amongst the, the vegetation here. This photo here is from a drone, and this little air thing here is actually a, a navigation aid, so it's a tower with a beacon on it, like a lighthouse. Again, unmanned. We have vertebrate and invertebrate assessments. So I'm happy to announce that we don't have any rats, we don't have any mice, we don't have any cats or dogs or humans. Well, so it's, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm saying that because that's a rare thing on islands anywhere in the world. And so these are wild, remote places that have maintained a naturalness. And a big part of my job or our job is to maintain that, to conserve it for the long term. We have a term in the management plan that says um, maintaining a natural state as possible. And, and that gives you a bit of flexibility, but it means know about it, what it is, and then keep it there as best we can. Um, and so we, we, we're happy that from the work we've done for the last four years, there's no pest insect species as well. So it's really quite useful. I don't know whether anyone knows about rodent trapping or understanding how you know you've got rats or mice. It's a, it's a tunnel, a black tunnel, and it has a... Um, uh, two entrances, and if there's a, a, a rat, then it'll walk in because there's peanut butter in the middle of it, which they love, and they walk over an ink pad onto a white pad, which is that pad, and that's the ink, and then they leave their footprints behind. So we go back and pick up the trap 24 hours later, and if we find the footprints, we know we've got rats. So that's the first stage to knowing, and then you do an eradication program if you need to. We don't have to do that. Um, there's um, a, a human, <laughs> a researcher, uh, a ranger, actually, like this guy here, doing the work that I'm talking about. Um, we, we're looking for anything we can find, insects under, under bits of debris or whatever, just to find if there's anything there that's not meant to be there. Um, we do bird and vegetation assessments as well. And when I say we do, it's a collaboration. So we're taking out the experts. I've got two volunteers that come out with us on voyages that are, one's a botanist. And they are so passionate. They just spend their whole day on these islands and they monitor and they count and they identify every plant species. That guy there is called Larry. And there's Joy. She's a botanist and she's a volunteer. She will come out with us. Um, anytime and work for us for free. It's incredible. Um, <laughs> these two here are, are, are rangers. They're employed by Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service. And they're mad keen bird phot photographers, as you can see by their cameras. Um, the, we have thousands of birds. It's quite an extraordinary amount of birds out there. Um, we have some critically endangered birds, which we're keeping an eye on. We have a full catalogue of plants now. We only know that we have two islands with weeds, which is quite extraordinary, given um, the past history, history of some of these islands. And we have Personia grandis, which is a, a, a tree that grows into a forest. Um, and, and we only have two islands with that, um, that type of plant on it, which is significant because it's a, a high forest tree, which allows birds, birds to roost. OK. Now, a little shout out to the people who like birds. So this one's shouting loudly, like, look at us. Um, these birds are so wild and, and they're not used to humans. So you can, you can get as close to these birds like that and they don't really want to move away. Um, we have 34 species and we have a critically endangered herald petrel and Last year, no, the year before, on one island, we found a nesting site for this particular species. And there's only two nesting sites known in Australia. On another island on the same voyage, we came across 50 nesting pairs of New Caledonian fairy terns, which is significant because there was only 300 known to exist. 
and, and that was on one island. So we're not sure whether that's added to the population or it's part of the same population. 690 breeding pairs of red-tailed tropic birds on one island as well. Um, these are significant numbers and that's a nationally significant nesting area. Um, sooty terns are incredibly abundant. There's so many that it's almost impossible to walk on these islands in case you step on a nest or a bird. It's so dense, it's incredible. Um, we even found buff banded rails. We're talking islands that are 500 miles offshore and buff banded rails don't fly very far. They kind of don't, they're ground dwelling. And then we've, we've found some of them that have evolved into a white version. So there's that breeding that's happened over a long time. Um, so we just find it's, it's, it's a discovery. Every time we go out into the Coral Sea, we take a voyage out for a couple of weeks and it's a, it's a discovery trip that is the incredible amount of information that we get. Okay, moving along, drone imagery um, is a key part of what we're doing. We're taking photographs of these islands and we'll be able to go back and take photographs over time to see whether they're changing because we're getting the image uh, quality down to less than a centimetre per pixel so you, we can identify the most smallest amount of change. Uh, there's those turtle nests, by the way. Um, and these islands are dynamic, they, they move. Um, so the drone imagery is important for us to use also for the vegetation and also the seabird counts and the dynamics of the, of the, the cave. And we put out information signs in case there's some people that go out there because people do visit, mostly say on a yacht or as, uh, on research or, um, or on, there are some charter fishing vessels. So we've installed these signs. Um, yeah, I was pretty happy about that one. Uh, that's my, that's uh, John, one of my colleagues, one of my staff. Um, and we're just putting these signs out to t tell people what they can't do as opposed to what they can. It kind of seems to work better for us. And there's a, a canister here with a map and a little log book that people can learn about where they are and they can write notes. Okay, marine debris I mentioned before. It's, a, it's an issue we're looking at. We have an accumulation of it. Um, it keeps on washing up. It's predominantly fishing gear. It's floats and nets and ropes. Um, shipping ropes is a, is, a, is a problem. This one's a shipping rope. They tend to be cut off the big cargo ships and they throw them overboard and they drift around and wash up on the islands and then they, they disintegrate over time. So every island that we visit, we, we pick this up. And, and take it back and we have a, a collaboration with uh, Tangaroa Blue, which is a non-government organisation that uh, monitors and collects marine debris and puts it into a database. We're learning about the debris type and where it's from, such as scanning the barcodes on water bottles to find out where it was made and where it was distributed to and therefore gives an idea where it was actually ended up in the water. And so we can try to have a bit of a relationship with those countries where these things are coming from. But it's interesting, when we look at what is the impact of marine debris on islands, well, actually, it's probably not that great. It's not as bad as what we would have thought. The marine debris, while it's in the water, is a bigger impact because you've got potential, uh, it's a potential food source, say for birds or turtles. But once it lands on islands, the critters tend to use it, such as this, this guy up here. I don't, most people would know what that is. Yeah, yeah. There you go. But um, <laughs> no, it's a film canister. Um, and birds are using the plastic in their nests. Um, that's a toothbrush. Um, there's a bottle cap and bottle cap. Um, so they're using them, but they're not eating them. So are they, is it a threat or a risk? Well, it's probably less of a risk than what we actually thought, but we will continue to pick it up and, and analyze it. Okay, turtles are a, a, an interesting project for us to understand. Um, six of the world's seven turtles occur in the Coral Sea and the Great Barrier Reef. Um, and the most common turtle in the Coral Sea is green, like you have over here. Um, the, Turtle research um, 
occurred you know, with 20 years ago was the main effort and there was not much work done since. So now we've been working on it and try to understand the stock, the indicators of the nest sites, the habitat use and the connectiv connectivity, where they go. Um, we're using aerial surveys as a way of doing this. And also um, we're looking at what, what is climate change doing to those habitats to um, whether the nesting sites are, are changing, reducing. Um, some turtles don't make it, which is a, a natural part of life. Um, and again, um, we're just learning about that a bit more now. We attached eight GPS trackers on green turtles in 2019 just to see where those turtles went. So we attached them on the turtles in this area here after they'd laid their eggs in those body pits. And then it was interesting, is almost immediately after they'd finished laying, they pretty much made this, this journey all the way back to the coast. This is Queensland and headed east, sorry, west and north. And this is their foraging areas. So this distance here that they travel was about 2000 kilometers. Didn't really stop. So these turtles are, nest, uh, are feeding in these regions and then they decide, okay, it's time to nest and they swim all the way out here and nest. They don't really feed much while they're out there and then they go back to feed. So it's huge migration. A recent project we've um, just uh, embarked on is to use a fixed wing aircraft and a consultant to go out and photograph the islands using eight cameras on a, on a, on a bar. And they're, they're, so the reason why they have eight cameras is because each camera has a slightly different angle. And so they're photographing these islands as they fly over an island and they get a stitched image that is really, really high resolution from one flyover of an island because it's costly to get out there. They, um, so to cover many islands, they fly an island once. And also, if they fly an island too many times, it'll disturb the birds. So this is a, a, a compromise. But what we're getting is really interesting photographs, hundreds of thousands of photographs put together to tell us what these islands look like and what the turtles are doing on the islands when they're nesting. So we get images like this from the sublime, um, basically probably one turtle, to the ordered up the beach, do your thing and go down the beach, to the ridiculous. <laughs> I don't know what happened that night, but. Um, <laughs> we're, um, the images are giving us a really interesting story here about the island change. So in February, 2022, this was the beach area available for turtles to nest. But in December that same year, it had changed dramatically. And so this is interesting for us, the vegetation is the same, but the actual beach habitat for turtles to nest in has changed in a short, short period of time. So we're going to be monitoring that over, over the years to see whether that's contracting or actually increasing. Um, with the turtle tracks, we're using AI to identify what is an up track and a down track, and therefore is it the same turtle? Um, what species it is? You can tell by the, the flipper shape and also what size it is. And so AI is becoming a really good part of what we do using these photographs. And for example, you know, if you put all, load all these images into a database and the AI takes over, you can, it's amazing it, it, the learning capacity. Okay, so oh, the other thing was body pits. I mentioned for turtles, we're understanding now what, what is a successful nest and what isn't. It, it's to do with the depth is one reason and other factors, but the red ones are deeper than the yellow and green ones. So the red ones are likely to be successful nesting nests. Um, but other factors such as temperature may, may affect the success of um, hatchlings. Okay, so that's it for islands in a nutshell. So now you're all ex experts on coral sea islands, yeah? <laughs> all right. I'll talk about reefs, uh, coral sea reefs. Like I said, we've got 1,830 and counting. We probably will know about more later. Um, I've got another project underway with a researcher who's a G GIS mapper, 
um, and he's remapping the whole coral sea for us using all the imagery that we've got and the historic data to to give us the most latest greatest um, uh, maps of the coral sea which is going to be really exciting because like i said when we wrote the management plan we had limited information and it was only until now that we know what we've got under the water is where a lot of work's been done over the last few years and um, studying these reefs has been logistically really hard because it's hard to get to to get the divers in the water um, and given the weather patterns to uh, study the corals and the fish um, the reefs in the Coral Sea are not like the Great Barrier Reef reefs or not like Ningaloo reefs. Um, they're not like the Caribbean reefs either. They're very different. They're much more similar to reefs in the Pacific Ocean in the, in the out right in the middle of the Pacific. Um, so they range from habitats like this and from high coral cover, high fish um, diversity and densities. Um, through to habitats like this. Now, what we've discovered is that habitat looks quite bland, or there's not much there, but what we have are new recruit corals. But this pink stuff, the, the crustaceous coralline algae, seems to be a very, very dominant um, characteristic of coral sea reefs. And we didn't realise this before, um, that even if these corals were not there, this is an actually active reef for the fish because it has habitat. It's, it's got three dimensionality. And what we're noticing after an event such as a cyclone or a coral bleaching event, then these structures are still maintaining themselves and there's a high growth of crustaceous coralline algae, which is great settlement um, area for, for new recruit corals. We engage researchers, like I said. A key research agency that we use is James Cook University. Um, and the researchers there are, are uh, experts in coral sea reef surveys. Uh, we're using diver surveys on transex, um, measuring corals, counting fish uh, on belt transects, as well as using uh, equipment such as, um, that, that's a BRUV baited remote underwater video um, and also um, loggers in the water to give us information about the water quality and the temperature and, and etc. But a lot of the work is, as you'd know, underwater with a slate in hand recording a, a most amazing amount of hours and, and time of, of people working on this one for us to understand these reefs. Um, a shout out to this guy here, Professor Andy Howey. He's the key researcher leading the reef work that we're doing in the Coral Sea. Um, he's laying a transect, but his role is to lay the transect and count the, the, the large predatory fish. The reason why he does it that way is because um, if you lay a transect out first and then count the predatory fish, you may have already biased the fish count. So he goes first and then another diver behind him counts the smaller fish, another diver comes behind and counts or does the coral measurements, etc. So there's a sequence of events on laying these transects out. And normally they'll dive a site and do three or four transects on a site and then they go to another site and do the same thing over and over again. And try to go back to the same or similar reefs each year so we get the same kind of data so we can compare. In 2018 uh, is when we first started the reef research work. Um, these uh, maps are colour coded maps for heat degrees heating weeks. Um, I won't go into the detail of how that is other than it's an indicator of how, how, how long the water temperature, water temperature has been higher than normal. And you see by the sequence here in 2018, there's a blue area here in the Coral Sea, um, a little bit of patch of lighter blue, but in 2020, there's a lot of red. And that was, that was hot water. In 21, a lot of hot water, some hot water in 22, not much in 23. So we've been monitoring the coral reefs during this, this heat wave event, which has caused stress on the corals, which has caused the, um, some corals to bleach and die. 
The research, um, actually this is a key research vessel. This is the type of boat that we need that go out in the Coral Sea. Voyages that could be anywhere from two weeks to four weeks um, out doing the voyage um, with, a, with a good team of people. The result of the 2020 bleaching event in the Coral Sea was quite severe, and it's called severe, being that a large percentage of the corals leached and actually died as a result. We also had bleaching of things like clams and anemones at the same time. So that was an indicator that things were pretty, very serious. Um, and that was in 2020, and we've been monitoring it every year since. Um, the, those bleaching events that occurred due to that, that high temperature um, level in, on those reefs, we've now seen a decline in coral on the Coral Sea. So there, it, it, it's not a happy reef system because it's um, declined in coral, but I'll tell you a little bit more about that, that in a second. We've had 67% decline in the coral cover during that time. It's likely that the coral cover is going to take a bit of time to come back. And so that's another part of the project to work out how, how fast, what species and where are they going to be coming back. Um, interesting also that the fish density or abundance also has declined on those reefs that have lost their corals. There's a but in this one, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, by the way, that's a settlement tile that has been deployed out a ceramic tile, do you use settlement tiles here? Yes, lots of it. Yeah, so people know what I mean by settlement tile. No, just a couple of shaking heads. Deploy these ceramic tiles on a reef and then go back a, a period of time later. And this is where new corals might recruit onto. And so you get an indication of how much coral is going to come back in that area. So, in these um, habitats, we're finding that we've had bleaching events, we've had loss of coral, but we've also got really good coral. We've got areas that are just maintaining themselves in happy condition. And like I said, we have areas that have this coralline algae, which is a really good habitat and it's sustaining an ecosystem that is, is still okay. So it's not a case of coral bleach, coral dead, nothing at all. It's just a slight change that's going on that we, we, we're keeping a close eye on. I'm going to throw some science graphs up here. I don't, I don't want you to get into the detail, don't worry. Um, but it's just proving that I do know something about science. <laughs> I, I, I pulled these out of the researcher's report, so I didn't do these. But these are just showing you that there's a, a oh, trend downward trend and this is coral cover and we split the coral sea up into the central part of the coral sea and the northern because it change, it's different um, because it's such a vast area but there's a downward trajectory in coral cover so that's obvious we know that um, when we break it down to the individual reefs or areas that we've researched there's still a downward trajectory in the coral cover so yep we know that we need to monitor what's going to happen next um, when we talk fish, it was a little, didn't really know what was going to happen with fish, but there is a decline in the fish, but not as, not what we quite expected. The, um, the biomass is kind of similar. There's a density change um, and a slight change in richness of, of fish species in the central, but not the northern. So this variability in the coral sea is my point here. And we can't just generalise too much. And I'm generalising too much here um, because if you go to the southern part of the Coral Sea, it's going to be different to the northern, and that's logical. And it has a different resilience about it. And it's species mix as well. This graph is purely just to show you we have a level of detail in the data that is really quite drilled down, right down to the finer detail to understand what's changing out there. And this is the fish and the functional group of, of the fish that are on these reefs, and is that changing um, on particular reefs and over time? Um, like I say, don't go into the detail, but it's just showing you that there are changes, but there are also some reefs that are staying the same. Um, depends on the fish species we're talking about. Uh, monitoring methods. 
Um, like I said, we're monitoring the effect of those heat waves on the corals and, you know, a healthy coral compared to a paling coral, so it's losing its zooxanthellae um, um, to, to bleached, fully bleached, we've got mortality, so it's all ranked and, and we're trying to understand, you know, if a coral does bleach to a certain point, it, it may recover and, and, and get its, uh, its algae back into itself. An interesting fact that's come up recently um, and the work is yet to be done is it seems to be a new species of um, algae which exists in some of the southern coral sea reefs. It doesn't exist anywhere else. It's a different species and it seems to be resilient to, to the temperature changes. So we, we're having a look at that one. Um, sorry, uh, that's a, a flow um, monitor. To, just to give us an idea of how much water movement's coming in and out of these reefs. It, it's a tilt monitor. So the water flows heavily, this thing will lean over. Um, and we have uh, yeah, it's salinity, temperature, and uh, I think there's a, that's a crustose coralline algae monitor, I think. Um, and also we're looking at the new recruit corals. So the tiny little corals are just coming in. You know, this is just over a centimetre in size and monitoring those as they come through and whether they survive. Another source of information, and this is an interesting one, where we've had two vessel groundings in the Coral Sea in the last year or so, um, which is going to happen given the shipping traffic and so forth that goes through the Coral Sea. But it actually gives us another way of getting information because this vessel, which is a tugboat, went out into the Coral Sea and deployed a um, tsunami monitoring buoy a float that detects whether there's a tsunami coming through. They deployed it and they were steaming back into port and they ran straight into a reef. Uh, and, and this is the damage that they did, which actually wasn't that much at all. But we sent a team of divers out there to survey the, the damaged site, but they also surveyed the whole reef as well. So they gave us extra information. Um, and there was very little damage to the reef, which is excellent. It could have been much worse. The vessel didn't fare too well at all. That's the hull. If you're looking up at the underneath of the vessel, um, the absolute they couldn't save that boat. It was back into port, so it survived. But I think they ended up wrecking it. Another vessel came through the Coral Sea, a Japanese longliner from down in the Southern Ocean, and it was steaming home to Japan. It did a strange thing, turned right all of a sudden, and ran straight into a reef. Um, this is 60 metres long, this vessel, heavy, and you can see that's where this bow went straight up onto the reef. Very lucky. It chose a reef patch that was really low in coral cover, and it was actually a gutter, and they went up onto it, and then they reversed off. So again, we sent a team of divers out there to research that, that area to determine with what impact, and we also surveyed the rest of the reef. So these things occur every now and then, they give us an opportunity to get more information. Um, hopefully it doesn't occur in an area where they had actually make a lot of damage. Okay, so our reef research work. Um, a couple of, on a, this is my attempt at a smiley face. I don't know whether anyone can see that. Um, we have 640 fish species that we know of so far in the Coral Sea, and that's counting. Um, most of them are uncommon or rare, certainly different to the Great Barrier Reef, which is next to the Coral Sea. Um, we have what we call bright spot reefs. There's five of them. These are areas that are out. They're quite separated, but for some reason these reefs are unique. They're surviving. They're, they're not susceptible to as bleaching as, as the other reefs are, and so there's something going on there. Something, something good about them that they are main, maintaining themselves. Um, they, for example, one of them is called Ashmore Reef in the most northern part of the Coral Sea. It's got 36% coral cover. And Mellish Reef, which is the most furthest reef offshore, 30% um, coral cover overall. Um, it varies, but these are, these are kind of bright spot or hope spots. Um, they seem to be they could be supplying recruits to surrounding areas, They're looking after themselves. 
um, a bit of a shining light. So they're giving us some really good information of um, how reefs can be resilient. Another really good news story, and this is, uh, we've discovered new fish species, and I said it's 600 odd species and counting. This is a new one, um, new one called Stormy Fish Betty, a bit of a nod to my, to my mum. Um, and has a species name, which I won't say. Um, this thing's only little, but that was discovered um, uh, a little while ago uh, in the cryptobenthic fish surveys that were being done to understand what lives in these coral areas that you can't normally see because they're so so hidden and 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 uh, so unfortunately, uh, you know, as scientists do, when we need to identify things and know about them, we need to get them out of the water and probably kill them. So poor Betty here. Um, is now uh, a famous fish in the photograph in a collection in a jar somewhere in a museum. Uh, the other bit of technology that we're using are um, ROVs. And this is proving to be really useful for us because of the first time we we're getting down to the deeper waters. So I forgot to mention the diving research in the Coral Sea is limited by policy and most diving only goes down to 15 metres deep. So what's feet? 45 feet, and that's it. On scuba, um, we don't tend to use nitrox. It's just on air. This technology is giving us the survey depths down to 100 metres, and it's down to 100 metres because currently that's the length of the tether line that it's got. <laughs> but it's also this technology, if you spend more money on it, it'll go deeper, so we, we're getting there. The researchers have been using this um, bit of equipment for a while now and surveying these deeper reef areas. And it's absolutely incredible that we're finding coral cover, high density coral cover, down to 100 metres. And it keeps going. Um, and which is kind of rare because most areas like that, the, the light penetration doesn't get down to that deep. So therefore, you don't have that, that algae growth or the. And, in the coral sea, the visibility is so great, the water is so clear that the light's penetrating. So fascinating, new discoveries, new habitats that we didn't know existed um, three years ago, we didn't know this was there. Um, and it, it's quite exciting bit of work which we'll continue on with. It's a bit of a blurry photo, but that's at 100 metres. And, and, it, and it's live hard coral and a lot of fish. It's almost as if you're up in the, in the shallows. It's the same. Um, quickly moving along here, fish species I mentioned. Um, this technology is giving us the ability to take photographs and analyze the species and also sizes and we're discovering new, new fish as well. Um, this is also being done by the, the um, baited remote underwater video as well in depths outside of diver range. Another little bit of work we've got is working with the indigenous community. We have one indigenous community up in the northern part of the Coral Sea. They're traditional owners, they're Torres Strait Islanders. They live between the tip of Australia and Papua New Guinea, um, which is right here. Uh, and they keep track of their seasons using a calendar like this. It's a, it's a They've managed to get it onto paper. It's, it's normally in their language and looking at the seasons and the changes of fish and the corals and the clams and the turtles and it's all related to, the, to their lifestyle depending on the season. We went up there and worked with the community to understand their understanding of the reefs and also get them involved in science and working with them to show them how we can study the reefs and also learn from them and get them in the water. Um, and so they were working with us to see how we do dive surveys you know, on a transect, and recording corals and fish, um, but also telling us what they knew about these corals and fish and their habit, habitats and their, their, their seasonal cycles. And so that was a fascinating project. Um, we're still working through the data on that one. And it was good to get them in the water with us. And it's also because they don't get the chance to get out in the water like, like this um, and, and work with us. So we, it was a great opportunity for them, but 
great opportunity for us as well. Um, yeah, there's a lot of fun. This is the ROV um, control station, and and um, <laughs> he was fascinated. It's like playing PlayStation, um, <laughs> driving the the ROV underwater below the boat. Um, so they they had a lot of fun, and it was a lot a lot of interest. Uh, this guy here is the like the the chair or the the chief of the village uh, that we took out with us. And to finish off, there's one other good news story. Is this coral is called Big Mel, and Big Mel was discovered a couple of years ago by by accident, diving over an area that we weren't really choosing to dive over. Big Mel is eight meters tall, about 19 meters in diameter, and 50 something meters in circumference. So she's big. Um, it's a massive parietes coral. They grow very, very slowly. Um, and in the photo in here is a coral core that we took down to a meter within Big Mel. And that gave us over 100 years of data layering. Um, we think that Big Mel is probably between 600 and 800 years old. So the amount of data that will be inside of Big Mel when we, we plan to go back and do another core sample and that'll give us information about the climate changes over the time during that, uh, maybe up to even a thousand years worth. So Big Bell's very famous. She's out there, she's a survivor. Um, we're very proud of her and she's in the most remote part of the coral sea you can get. Um, if you ever get to dive Big Mel, then um, that would be a, a huge tick on your, on your dive slate. Um, so, done all right for time, I think, yeah. Um, so that's me, that's um, the Coral Sea Marine Park. I hope you understand a bit more about it. Um, Big Mel, what was the new little fish called? Daddy? Where's the Coral Sea? How big is it? Really big. Really <laughs> big. <laughs> and and um, thank you, I really appreciate it. I forgot to say one thing. Yeah, um, big shout out to James Cook University, who are the key researchers doing the reef work for us. So um, all the, most of that, if not all the data on the reef stuff, it comes from them. Um, uh, Centre of Excellence and Professor Andy Howey. Um, Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service are a, a state government agency that work with us, and they supply the staff and the expertise to monitor those islands. I had a big shout out there. Wow, this was great. Thank you very much. Uh, Ames at your wonderful sea simulator is doing a lot of hybridization to create what they're calling super corals. Are any of the, geno uh, geno the genomes from the coral sea being utilized in that no, project? No, not yet. Yeah, so that's, the, it may happen, but not that I'm aware of. We actually did a, a, a another interesting project where we we took corals um, up onto a back deck of a boat and put them into tanks to see their susceptibility to temperature change. And it's shown that there are some species out there that are much more resilient for reasons we still don't know. And, and they, related they to that, part of that project. Yeah. Related to that, and forgive me because I'm a geek, do you happen to know the genus of the algae that you no. referred to? No, because I only just learned about it the other day. Um, a, a research colleague of mine, Hugo Harrison, who's in the UK at the moment, um, he was looking at that for us. So he'll be, it's not published yet, so I can't really say too much about it. So regarding your management plan that you were talking about, what are your guys' plans or action items to kind of combat global warming or ocean acidification? Is it planting those tiles for the corals to recruit? or maybe growing corals and planting them? Or what, what are you guys planning to do to maybe fight against those issues, if, if anything, other than yep. additional research? Yep. yep, good question. So the Coral Sea, it, the, for the last few years, and what we're currently doing now at the moment is understanding it. 
that's the first step before we launch into trying to uh, influence or change something. So we're understanding the current status and health and what's in it. And like I've said, we're realising that it's actually different out there. Great Barrier Reef is a different story. They've got a very big program about coral restoration and planting, um, finding corals that are resilient and, 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 and moving them around. We're not in that game at all yet with the Coral Sea. It's not part of our management approach. Um, the management approach is to understand it, maintain it, like I said, keep it as natural. And how do we do that? Well, we reduce the impacts on it the best we can. We're very lucky in the Coral Sea because we don't have coastal development. We don't have, you know, um, riverways that are being polluted and then flushing out because there's no rivers out there. Um, so we, we have a very unique and I can say it pristine system. But the key pressure that the Coral Sea has on it at the moment is, is climate change, you know, the, the elevated sea surface temperatures. All we can do at this stage is, is monitor that and try to understand it. Down the track, new technologies are changing all the time. We could actually have resilient corals that could be useful for elsewhere, for example. I'd like to ask you, go back to the turtles. In Florida here, we've had significant uh, rise in beach temperature, which of course affects the gender, especially on the West Coast. I'm not sure about the East Coast of the state. But what, have you made any observations? Because there with the, what you were showing. Yeah, good question. Um, we'll get another hour. To, <laughs> um, sorry, the turtle story. Um, everyone knows about that um, temperature thing with feminization. Um, and so we've been doing some work on that and putting temperature loggers into the sand um, to give us an idea of the change and whether it's increasing or not. And if there's increased temperature in the sand, the turtles turn out to be female. Yeah? But the effect of that could be in 20, 30 years' time when they're in reproductive age. Yeah, it's interesting. So we do have turtle monitoring as part of our program. It's not a high priority because well, we're not sure what to do about that one and whether it is a natural fluctuation or not. The turtles have been doing this for a long time too. Yeah. Did that answer your question, kind of? Yes, thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm Tom from Pennsylvania. I had a question about the island, how come some of the caves don't have any vegetation at all? Yeah, um, like I said, they're all, all the caves and islands are almost at the same height. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're three metres or six metres above the sea, the, 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 the sea level. So they've kept up with the rise of sea level. Um, some of them haven't quite got there yet, so they wash over. And if they're washing over, the vegetation can't. Take, it, take hold. If they're up to a certain height and they maintain that height, then the birds are landing on them and, and creating a habitat with um, guano. And, and there's also the marine debris, uh, trees, logs, shells that are built it up to make the habitat for plants. A really interesting thing though is another project I have that I'd like to start soon is to work out what plants were on the islands 100, 200 years ago compared to now, because we used to have a guano mining industry out there 100 years ago, where people dug up the, the bird poo and took it back as fertilizer, or phosphorus. Um, and we also had sea cucumber and trochus fishes who used the islands and they used to cook the sea cucumber. So we don't know what they used to cook the sea cucumber. Were there bigger forests? We don't know. So there's a bit of a history project there we want to do. Um, yeah, on some of your uh, graphs, you showed, you know, the northern and the southern comparisons, and it always seemed like the northern were a little bit above the southern and less decline, and they started a little higher. Is there any explanation? I mean, is there deeper water and, and you know, upwelling of cooler yeah, water? You hit the nail on the head. Um, it seems like these islands, these reefs, have upwellings. And it would make sense because you've got these vast mountains, you know, and so when the, the flow of the water hits them, they would rise up and bring the cooling water. 
but it depends on whether that cooling water is coming up at the right time when the sea super temperatures are hot. And that's what we don't quite know about. Um, it's very dynamic out there and it changes. Um, so yes, the answer is yes. It seems like there is the, the reef uh, that we studied up in the north where we took the traditional owners, the indigenous out on, that's right up in the north. It's hot water. It's, it's really warm water up in Papua New Guinea, that area. But these reefs are in absolutely beautiful health. They're, they're extraordinary. Good coral, good fish. Um, the bleaching effect isn't happening there. We suspect that it's the, 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 the upwelling plus the species seems to have a resilience. Um, that's where the turtles are going to forage. Yeah. So when you spoke to um, the ability to track sea debris based on barcodes, would you be willing to let us know where the propensity or the preponderance of that trash was originating from? Where was it produced? Yeah, this is live streamed. <laughs> Southeast Asia, um, Pacific Islands is, is uh, a key area for these, these plastic bottles mostly. We, we find a lot of plastic bottles, bottle caps, so they take the caps off and throw the two apart for some reason. And dare I say it, thongs, which is, I should say, flip flops. Um, you should speak to Anna Deloach. She has a lifetime project on um, finding singular flip flops and determining if left ones float one direction or right ones float another. <laughs> Apparently they do. Yeah, they yeah, do. yeah. All right. I know it's getting late. So, yeah, Carlo, wrap us up. Hi. You showed a photograph of a Japanese longliner. How successful is the, are you or, or is Australia in being able to monitor and keep their waters and defend your EEZ uh, from other countries? Yeah, um, it's difficult because we have such a, a large ocean around Australia and EEZ. Um, the Japanese longliner that I showed a photograph of was traveling home, so they're allowed to do that to come through Australia's waters, but they can't stop and fish. Um, back in the 90s, that vessel could fish in Australia's waters under a, an agreement. They don't anymore. But how do we monitor that? Well, those vessels are on a, a tracking system anyway, like a global tracking. But we use aerial surveillance is our key method to monitor the borders of Australia's waters. Um, and that's a risk-based approach as well. Uh, so they'll fly those waters where there's higher chance of incursion. Um, currently, there's, there's uh, you might have seen it in the news, maybe not over here, but there's some vessels coming in from Indonesia into Australia's waters on the northwest, and they're coming in to fish. Um, and so we that's where our attention is to, to, to monitor those. Um, very few vessels come into the Coral Sea. We did have eight vessels from Vietnam who came into the Coral Sea six, eight years ago, um, and we, we caught several of those boats. The other ones left really quickly. Um, we brought those boats in and detained the crew, um, destroyed the boats and sent the crew home. Um, but they were, t they were catching sea cucumber. All right. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Martin. That's all right. A great first day of seminars. Really exciting. We've got another uh, great lineup for tomorrow. So have fun if you're out on the water tomorrow. Be safe. And then we'll see you back here at 2 o'clock. Thank you. Good night, everybody. <laughs>